Did everybody have a wonderfully quiet 4th of July? <laughs> we thought for sure there were going to be some lawbreakers out there. I was so certain. Man, it got dusk, and we went out on the deck. Man, what a valley full of law-abiding citizens. <laughs> what a boring 4th of July. <laughs> wow. Thursday night wasn't bad. Thursday night wasn't bad. <laughs> Uh, we actually have a couple of Ask the Pastor questions today. Um, first question, did Jesus die for everyone or just the ones the Father gives him? Yes. But I did expound. <laughs> Scripture tells us in numerous places that Jesus' price, the price he paid on the cross, was for all people. John 3.16. Any that would believe. Uh, 1 Timothy 4. Do you remember the reference? 17. Wrong, it was 10. I wrote it down. <laughs> Josh actually found this one for me. By the way, our intern is doing the research as well. All these questions that are coming to me, I give to him, and he has to give me an answer. So, uh, yeah, yeah. But not a whole lot more. First um, John two two says that he paid the price for all sin. Yes. Okay. However, this is where things get complicated for us of simple minds. God is omniscient. Scripture says that those he foreknew, he predestined. God already knows, and has always known, who is going to accept him. God has made a way such that any that would accept him can. Okay? I mean, oh, no, Pastor, are you preaching predestination? Are you pre No, I'm not dealing with either of those. I'm dealing with the nature of the God we serve, who in his sovereignty has made a way for us to have a choice. He already knows who will choose, so it's no mystery to him. It's only a mystery to us. Okay, so did he die for everyone? Absolutely. All sin was paid for on the cross. But only those that receive the gift of grace will be inheritors of it. Okay, so there's a little bit more on my answer there. The second question, um, so often the Bible references <coughs> fasting and praying. Esther and Mordecai prayed and fasted for three days. Other times I have heard seven days and so on. What does that mean, and how does one fast and pray? What are the requirements? It's up to you. <laughs> this one was actually a little bit more involved, uh, as far as answering it fully. Um, I believe that fasting is denying a physical need in order to dwell more in the spiritual, to develop and work and increase the spiritual. Uh, I have seen people fast everything from food to television to golf. Now, honestly, television and golf, I don't see as needs, but others might. Right, Dennis? Okay. But it's willingly setting aside something of yours to embrace something of his. Now, the thing about this is, it's not just giving something up, okay? Because you're going to replace it with something. Over and over and over in Scripture, we see fasting almost consistently with food, okay? People would do partial fasts where they would fast certain meals of the day. They would do full fasts where they, they absolutely did not touch any food and sometimes any food or drink, okay? Um, <clears throat> But they didn't just sit at the table and have fellowship while everybody else was eating. They would take that time and they would press into God. Okay, How long? I don't know. Some of them set specific amounts of time. The example given was Esther and Mordecai, three days. Okay, In Three days, we're going to fast and then this is going to happen. Others fasted until they got an answer. Daniel, he just fasted until the angel showed up. All right. So, what does it mean for you? I don't know. 
For me, there are certain things God tells me that I need to give up because they're distracting me from Him. So I lay them down. And sometimes He says, okay, you've got that right, you can pick it back up again, keep it in its proper place. Sometimes He tells me you just got to let it go, you don't get that anymore. Okay? So, what is a fast for me could look radically different than a fast for you. All right? I believe with all of my heart that the normal Christian life will have fasting. Okay? I, I honestly believe that. I know that flies in the face of a lot of what our culture tells us, where you indulge everything you want right now in the moment. But I believe that in denying yourself those indulgences and even those necessities, that's, that's some of the only way you're going to grow in maturity the way that God wants you to. When you say, you know what, I'm putting this aside, God, and I'm pressing into you. So, um, that's the short answer. Your questions will be up here at the front. If you would like the, the written out answers with other scripture references. Um, spiritual warfare. We have been in a study for a number of weeks, and, and I'm sure some of you are probably surprised that I'm just now getting to what I'm getting to. Um, we are going to talk about the armor of God. So go ahead and turn to Ephesians chapter 6. Last week we kind of set this up. Um, we're going to go ahead and read. Starting in verse 10. So Ephesians chapter 6, we're picking up in verse 10. Paul says, finally, this is kind of the summation, the summary of everything that he's been getting to at this point. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. And then Paul adds a, a personal note. And also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Okay. Last week, we actually managed to cover three verses. That was exciting. You guys should be excited. Three verses! That's, that's almost two full verses more than they cover in the women's Bible study. <laughs> well, honestly, I think we could spend a lot of time on just part of one verse. And, and today, we are actually, my goal is to get through, uh, starting in verse 13, Therefore take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand firm, stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth. That's what I want to cover today, the belt of truth. Uh, Josh, I put up on Dropbox a picture of armor. Do you, could you put that up for us, please? I know I kind of surprised you. Okay, this is something what Paul would have been looking at as he was penning this letter. Okay, now first thing you need to understand is Paul is not really original in his idea of the armor of God. 
All right. Isaiah makes reference to uh, the breastplate of righteousness in Isaiah chapter 59. All right. It's something that kind of weaves its way in and out. But Ephesians, actually Paul makes reference to it in 1 Thessalonians as well. One of the first letters that we have from Paul in 1 Thessalonians. And, and now he's going on to expound on it and then to, to do a bigger writing on the armor of God at one of what we believe is his last letters. Okay? Paul is uh, in prison at this point. Um, he's under house guard in Rome. <laughs> he's waiting to be presented to Caesar to defend his case as a Roman citizen against the accusations the Jews were bringing against him. Um, <clears throat> this is one of four prison epistles that Paul wrote. Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and does anyone remember the last one? Philemon. Okay. And actually, if you look at Colossians, Colossians kind of points out some of the things in Philemon. Okay? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so Paul is under house arrest, and there's a Roman soldier guarding him day and night. Now, he was allowed people to come in to minister to his needs, and so we see a lot of the references, those that are with Paul, but there is always a Roman soldier there because Paul, obviously being such a threat, needed to be guarded. And this is something akin to the armor that uh, he would see regularly. Okay? And we've, uh, you know, I've seen the t-shirts, I've seen the posters of these uh, knights in huge shining armor, and great. If that's the kind of armor you're wearing, fantastic. But I want to get you kind of perspective of what Paul's looking at. All right? So the belt of truth that he refers to, you can't see. Okay? Uh, and it's kind of interesting. Uh, does anybody have a, a translation other than the ESV? Yes. Okay, uh, would you read the first part of verse 14 for me? Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Okay, what translation is that? NASB. NASB. Did, did somebody have something different over here? NIV. NIV, would you read that? Stand firm, then, with all the truth, walk under your waist. Okay. The NASB is actually the, the, the best rendering of this passage. I really, I don't care for the ESV's rendering of this, because the ESV simply says, uh, having fastened on the belt of truth. Okay, but, but the Greek is very clear in that what he is asking you to fasten about is to protect your loins, okay? It's, it's to protect sensitive areas. And if you look on this, this armor here, um, there would be a belt that would be fastened about the waist, and then from the belt they would hang these leather strips, and oftentimes they would rivet metal plating onto it or, or bronze to give it weight so it would, it would stay down, but it would protect what I consider a very vital area. <laughs> um, you would guard your loins, all right? So when the NASB translate that, you know, read it again for me. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth. Girded your loins with truth. It's not just a belt like I'm wearing here, okay? It's a military article of war that was worn for battle. It's not just to keep your britches up, or in this case, the skirt, the kilt, whatever it is. Okay? So, Paul is looking at a Roman soldier, and he's comparing a very mundane thing to a spiritual reality. So let's, let's kind of back up for a minute. Before we get into the belt, what's the first thing that Paul tells us in verse 14? Stand firm. Stand firm. Thank you. You guys don't have to whisper in here. If you're wrong, I'll let you know. <laughs> we stand. Stand firm. Feet planted. All right? I took self-defense for a number of years. One of the key things that they taught me early on was balance, okay? 
Because it's not just about keeping your own balance, it's about getting your enemy unbalanced. All right? So planting your feet so that you can move any direction, keeping your weight centered so they can't knock you off balance, being able to react. Stand firm. Okay? Now, we plant our feet, we stand firm. Why? Well, th this, this whole passage starts off with a, a therefore. What's the therefore, therefore? Paul has already told us why we are waging war, why we need to stand firm. Because we are fighting a deadly, monstrous enemy. All right? Our battle is against the devil and his forces, his minions. The evil ranking and hierarchy, however that works, in the spiritual realm. Okay? And if you're not standing firm, you're going to get knocked on your can. Or on your face. Or on your back. So Paul is telling us, the first thing you need to do is make sure you've got a good stance. Stand firm. Firmly planted. Unmovable. Okay? Now you say, well, yeah, that's, that's, that, that makes sense. But what does that mean in day-to-day -day life? How easily moved are you? Um, James talks in chapter 1 about asking for wisdom. And he says that, that God gives generously without finding fault. But he gives a caveat. He says, but when you ask, you must believe. Because if you don't believe, you're, you're tossed to and fro. Okay? You're, you're blown about. And I've, I've seen Christians like this. They're going, yes, this is what God wants for me right here. Right here. Oh, wait, wait. No, it's over here. No, over here. And they can't plant their feet because they're chasing after every whimsy. Okay? We have got to plant our feet on the truth. Now, we're going to get into the belt of truth. What the heck is truth? Okay, now this is something that has troubled me for years. And quite honestly, uh, even in college, when we were going over this, I, I, I had a, a bit of an issue with this. And I actually heard a pastor, uh, James McDonald, about a year ago, that gave me one of, an answer to what I was looking for. Now, you guys can take this or leave it. It's up to you. I don't believe it's the word. Okay? Why? Because the word is our sword. Why would he give us two articles of the same thing? I mean, what, wouldn't he, why was he so careful to specify? Okay? So, if it's not the word, then what does that, and, and for a long time, I just reconciled myself to, I, I guess Paul was just being redundant. I, I guess, I don't know. So, so just, just bear with me for a minute. If it's not the word, then what is it? Well, is it one plus one equals two? Is it whatever goes up comes down? Is it things left to themselves will tend to decay? Those are all truths, aren't they? Well, unless you're standing on the moon and you throw something up and it just keeps going. It's not empirical data. It's not scientific fact. So I, I think we'll just take that and we'll set that to the side for a minute. Okay, so we've set aside God's word. Not, not because we're leaving it alone, but because we're going to pick it up again later. What, what does that leave us? What's that? Honesty. Honesty. Perfect. What about the truth in the way you live? What about the sincerity in which you live? What if the truth that we are to gird about ourselves is how we really are. What if this is Paul's telling us? Set about yourself, your loins, the girdle of truth, the belt of truth, to protect you from hypocrisy. See, one of the number one, the, the biggest accusation against the church today I'm just going to say by far and away. What do you hear about Christians and the church? 
Hypocrisy, you're a bunch of hypocrites. And if it were just the world, I could go Pff. But it's not just the world. Christians are saying it. Dude, that's crazy. You know what is the most despised country in the world? They, they actually did a study on this. I don't know how you do a study on this. How do you measure it? But France is considered the least liked country in the world. And you know who likes them the least? The French. The French. <laughs> uh, seriously. <laughs> Parisians, people that live in Paris, voted France as their worst country by far and away. Isn't that ridiculous? Move! <laughs> Make it better! But that's exactly what we're seeing in the church. We've got Christians who refuse to belong to a fellowship because it's full of hypocrites. Thank you, Christian, for proving our point. Yeah, we've got hypocrites. Nobody wants to be thought less of. Nobody wants people to see them unmasked. You guys would not like me unmasked. I don't know that you like me now, but that's okay. Christy has seen me unmasked. And that's right there, the grace of God at work in a person's life. Thaddeus has seen me unmasked. Christopher and Benjamin have seen me unmasked. I can be a stinker when I get in my flesh. I would have used another word, but it's inappropriate. The scripture says I'm not supposed to use obscene language. I can be a stinker, but there's always that incredible but, but God. Okay? God is working out things in me that I didn't even know were there. The belt of truth Let's say, let's just start with, it's how we truly are. Okay? Not how we represent ourselves to other people. Not the mask that we don when we come into church. Not that thing when you're, you're driving to the supermarket and you're grumbling and it's hot and that person just took your spot and now you've got to walk three extra feet because you've got to go to the next spot and then you walk into the store and you walk up to somebody from church. Hi! Good day! you! Oh, I'm so blessed! Yes! Oh, well, it was good to talk. I'll be praying for you. $2.99! There was a buck ninety-nine yesterday! Oh, come on. Really? Now, please, I am not asking you all to drop your masks right now. Please don't. Please don't. All right? <coughs> but really, how much of that mask do we hold in front of our face when we look in the mirror? How about personal responsibility? How about accepting that you are where you are because of the choices you've made? How about it's not your mom and dad's fault? It's not your boyfriend or girlfriend, husband or wife or former. It's not their fault. It's not the government's fault. It's not anything but you. Okay? You can't control how people act. I wish you could have seen me in worship with my two-year-old grandson. I could not. Ooh. <laughs> you, can't, you cannot control anyone. If you think you can, I will let you spend 20 minutes with him. <laughs> but let me get him wound up first. <laughs> okay? All right? But you can control how you react. As a matter of fact, it's not a matter of can, it's a matter of you have to. Scripture doesn't give us the choice to get in our flesh. It says don't. It says that's a sin. That's a grievous offense before God. Who are we supposed to represent? Christ. 
Okay? So when somebody offends us, what does Christ say we should do? What? I, I heard offense. Forgive. Forgive. Okay? Are we supposed to get in our flesh and respond out of our own selfish whatever? I don't deserve to be treated like this, or I do deserve to be treated better? Okay? Well, think about this for a minute. How did Jesus deserve to be treated? Like a king. How about like God? Like the one and only God. The one true God. And yet, he was put in our place and he suffered horrific abuse. I mean, not... Uh, Okay, we get hurt because people say hurtful things. They said every hurtful thing that could possibly be said <coughs> to him and about him who was coming for their sin to die in their place. <coughs> and then they beat him and scourged him. And it wasn't just the Romans because the Jews made sure he was beat before they sent him to the Romans, and then he went and suffered on the cross and died in my place, okay? So when somebody says something offensive to you or hurtful to you, stop for a minute. Stop for a minute. Jesus was already in that place because, see, before it ever came out of their mouth, it was a sin before God, and it was an offense to God. All right? And that offense was paid for by the blood of Christ at Calvary. Did you get that? So if God, who was offended first and probably offended deepest because he got to see what was in that heart that you didn't, you just got to hear what came out the mouth. If he can forgive them and he can choose not to take offense what right do I have to take offense now this is great while we're sitting here talking about this intellectually but what about the real world what about the real world what about when that person cut you off and took your spot after you circled the parking lot five or six times, waiting for the little old lady to put her bags in so you could take her spot. And then you walk in and it's 96 degrees and you're sweaty and you're uncomfortable and you hate the heat and you move to Montana to get away from the heat. And you walk in and the only cart that they've got has a broken wheel. I'm gonna go down this aisle. No, I'm not, I'm going that way because the cart won't turn that way. Okay, you have your own bad day, all right? This is my bad day. <laughs> okay? And, and so you walk in, and somebody walks up and cuts you off, and you're like, excuse me. You say, I'm being civil. Oh, excuse me. I didn't see you there, you rat. <laughs> if I had, I'd have pushed the cart harder. <laughs> and they just ignore you, or they snub you, or they give you a crusty look and go on because you took their spot. What if your spouse says something cutting? What if after all that and they didn't have Twinkies <laughs> and you got home with a cruddy box of cupcakes and you walk in the door and your wife goes, why'd you get cupcakes? I like ding-dongs. She wouldn't do that to me, because she likes cupcakes, okay? But it could be your spouse. Why don't you ever do anything right? I sent you to the store for one simple thing. It takes you 40 minutes and you come home with the wrong thing. Did you even go to the right store? Oh yeah, I did, I drove right through it. <laughs> what if they say something really hurtful? What if they start bringing up your errors from the past? Wouldn't be a regular Sunday without. <laughs> what 
should your response be? I know if, if my day has gone from bad and ran downhill fast to worse, Christy doesn't even have to say anything offensive to get me going sometimes. Sometimes she can just say something thoughtless. Do I have the right to react out of my flesh? No, I have a responsibility to act according to the Spirit. Remember that back in Galatians chapter 5? Which, which am I exhibiting and how I'm acting? Do what you have to do to walk according to the Spirit. To not act according to the flesh. To not give in to that impulse to be snide or snotty or rude or just outright disgusting in what you say or do. Okay? So, the belt of truth. What if this is just being able to examine who we are sincerely, truthfully, honestly, such that we can then change or help to change or allow God to change those yucky parts of us instead of just shelving them for a couple hours on a Sunday and for those few minutes when you run into me at the grocery store. Kimberly, I'm sorry, but sometimes I go to Hamilton when I'm in a bad mood. <laughs> I don't have to put on the pace. Okay? That's not true. I don't ever do it because of that. I do it because Taco Bell's in Hamilton and not in Stevensville. Uh, <laughs> you know, well, and if you knew me, you'd know that's not a good thing for me. I do that for Christy. All right? So, if we will be honest with ourselves and allow God to show us how we really are, then he can start changing in us because uh, you, can't, you can't deal with, you can't fix something you refuse to deal with. It, it doesn't work. I've been waiting for my faucet to stop leaking for four years and it won't. So you got to take the stupid thing apart and then realize you broke it worse and then call Tom Kern and have him come out and fix it. <laughs> I don't know, it was working when you fixed it the last time and it broke since then. Okay. If you refuse to look at yourself in the light of God's truth, okay? Now, this isn't to, to, to look at all the bad, because some of us have a problem looking at the good. Some of us have difficulty looking at the way that God sees us and, and the good that we do and the, the things that God uh, applauds and commends in us. We, we don't look at the things that we've done right. But if we look at ourselves in truth, we allow God to speak to us. We allow God to deal with us in truth. That kind of changes the whole dynamic of being armored. Because if you look at yourself in truth and somebody comes against you and says something that is truth, you already know it. You're already prepared for it. And chances are, if you're really letting God work in, you're already being dealt with. So it's not going to be an offense. It might even be confirmation. You, you love it when your spouse says something wonderful and warm to you like, you're not quite the jerk you were two years ago. <laughs> and I take that and go, yes! No, I don't. I go, ouch. So how much less of a, I guess, how much more of a jerk am I still now? Well, if you were a 10 before, you're probably a 9.2. <laughs> Progress. You know, it, it still might hurt, but we have God living inside of us. How many closets have you locked him out of? How many do you refuse to go into? Or refuse to bring him into? Do you have a, a, a rec room in your life where you go and lock God out so you can do the things that you want to do because that's what your flesh likes? We all do. Some of us have really well-furnished rec rooms. Some of us just have closets where we keep our few prized trophies and things that we like to reminisce and look at. Okay? Truth, the belt of truth. Gird about your loins. Set about you truth. 
Look and see. Allow God to show you all that he sees in you. The bad and the good. Because, look at this. God has given you his very righteousness. You stand before him righteous and pure and holy. Because otherwise you couldn't stand before him at all. Don't be afraid of where God will take you. Okay? Don't be afraid of where God will take you. Because God is going to go there before you to make your way smooth and sure. God is going to go there with you to uphold you in the battle. And God is going to be behind you as your rear guard. He will shelter you in the shadow of his wing. It may look ugly. It may look scary. It may bring you to a place that you never thought that you would go. But he will not only bring you there, he will bring you through it. And ultimately, 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 what is the worst that can happen in this life? I die. I, I get to go spend eternity with him. I get to be transposed from this moment to eternity like that. Wow. What a reward. What a reward to go from looking at those who would hate and despise me because of who I serve to standing in the presence of the one I serve and having him look at me and say, well done. Really? Really? Paul says these are light and momentary afflictions. Read Corinthians and see what his light and momentary afflictions consisted of. I haven't been through much of that. Never been shipwrecked. I've been stuck in Kansas three times. <laughs> three. Light and momentary. Why? Because God is with you in the moment. Amen? Amen. Father, we bless you. We ask, Lord God, that we would set about our loins the belt of truth, the girdle of truth that would protect us, Father. Protect us from hypocrisy. Protect us from self-deceit. Protect us from the lies that we tell ourselves so that we can be comfortable, pleased with ourselves. Help us, Father, to see ourselves as you see us, the good and the bad, those things you applaud and those you desire to correct. Help us, Father, to stand firm as the enemy seeks to come in and lie to us about who we are. We are children of the living God. We are inheritors co-heirs with Christ. We are dearly loved of you. Help us, Father, to see through the deceit and the lies. Help us not to be cowed by the horror that he would send our ways. Help us, Father, to stand firm, unmoved, unshaken, knowing that you have planted us. Give us wisdom, Father, to know how we should treat with others, both in the body of Christ and those without. Father, that we would be your true representatives. We bless you today, Father. We thank you for how good you are to us. We honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.